During World War II, the US Army built tons of air bases on all the islands and atolls they could find in the Pacific Theatre. Some of these islands weren't uninhabited though. Many had native humans with only Stone Age technology available to them. How did these people respond to the military bases? Well, as Arthur C. Clarke wrote, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And indeed, the locals seemed to be completely stunned by this advanced technology, which was millenniums more advanced than theirs. But there's one thing they noticed above all else. The Americans turned up never seemed to do any work. There was work in the eyes of the islanders. No hunting, no fishing, no gathering. Nor did they seem to repair or make any of the fantastical items they owned. Yet they seemed to have all they could ever want, turning up first in boats, and then in planes in the form of cargo. The islanders believed there was some big secret to getting the planes and boats to come to your home, and the Americans from across the sea knew this secret. Instead of actual work in the eyes of the islanders, all the Americans ever seemed to do was march around in lines with identical clothes and strange sticks, or sit behind desks and rub a small stick in a very specific way on a very thin slice of tree and these great gifts seemed to descend from the heavens. Many of the native peoples came to the conclusion that they were being rewarded for religious devotion. To the locals, these were supernatural rewards for these strange actions. If the natives wanted this cargo, they would have to copy these strange rituals. So they started building crude runways and fake planes out of bamboo and leaves in an attempt to lure planes down. They also started marching around dressed the same, with coloured sticks over their shoulders like rifles. It is striking how these cults popped up nearly everywhere these air bases were placed. With no actual connections between them, the people drew the same conclusions. However, as these methods failed to gain the local people any cargo, an idea developed. Even though they met with no success, they did not give up. Many cargo cults continued into the 60s and 70s, at least, trying desperately to bring the cargo that they believe is theirs down to their handmade landing strips and out of the hands of those greedy Americans. Well, you might ask, what does all of this have to do with the game of tennis anyway? Apparently, a lot more than some of us would be willing to admit. Because... When it comes to learning or teaching tennis, people, in general, would much rather rely on this Stone Age know-how instead of the intellect which they claim to be so proud of. And thus, with some purely cosmetic alterations, the cult of the cargo is alive and well. If a backhand stroke, a forehand stroke, or a serve of a particular player becomes an object of desire for a whole bunch of people. Then, for all practical purposes, these things can be viewed as just another form of cargo which all these people are trying to possess. And how do all these good people choose to go about acquiring that cargo. Surprise, surprise. Same as before. By way of copying. By copying various behavior manifestations of that cargo's owner. All of which are rather tenuously related to the production of the precious cargo which they so desire. Under the guidance of their elders, the students around the world are tirelessly parroting the positions of the wrists, the angles of the feet, the bend of the knees, or the path of the racket, and anything else that they would deem to contain the secret of the cargo. But since nobody, including the players themselves, seems to know for sure, where this secret is contained, and thus, what exactly, must be copied. It is not surprising, 
that the recipes for success differ so greatly. And so, just as their ancestors before them, the converts endlessly perform these hollow rituals and then faithfully wait for the cargo to arrive. If prior experience could teach people anything, which more often than not, it sadly doesn't, they would surely learn by now that any precious cargo is obtained only by way of engineering. In the particular case of tennis, it should be the reverse kind. Reverse engineering is a specialized field of engineering where mechanical devices, or anything else for that matter, are not conceived and then created from scratch, but rather, the design information and the working principles are extracted by way of examining an existing device. And then, based on the extracted information and the acquired understanding of the working principles, a new device which performs as well as the original, can be constructed. Only such an approach to learning tennis, which is based first on understanding and then application of the working principles, can ensure the arrival of your cargo. Mindless parroting, mimicking, or miming cannot. No matter how realistic or convincing it looks. Doing everything like Roger. Flexing your wrists, bending your knees, pointing your toes, raising your racket, dressing or even looking like Roger. None of it can bring you any closer to striking the ball like Roger. When it comes to cargo, only working like Roger counts. <laughs> <laughs>